with every reaction, of course. Um, what I'd like you to look back again um, and uh, look for all of those uh, little cues um, as to tell you that this is a single replacement reaction. So just remember the things I told you. you got always going to have an uh, um, atom in its elemental state reacting with a compound, an ionic compound, and going to another atom in its elemental state and replacing it with the first one. In the ionic compound, the cation originally was. 
picture example, of course, of a um, single replacement reaction. This one's a little weirder. Just uh, hydrogen is being replaced, um, or the copper is being replaced by one of the, or both of the hydrogens in this case. So a double replacement reaction is always going to be a non redox reaction. And you'll usually find these between two ionic compounds that kind of do the dosey -si go -si and switch partners. Okay. So uh, two compounds undergo an exchange of partners to produce two new compounds. So we, you see we go AB plus CD goes to AB plus CD. And you see that um, uh, B and C are now partners and A and B are now partners. So um, B and or A and C kind of switch partners. Um, you can see these are all going to be examples of ionic compounds, and they've all switched partners. Lead nitrate, uh, sodium chloride, now we have lead chloride and sodium nitrate. If you go over these reactions, what you'll find is if you try to do the oxidation numbers of all of these different atoms in these compounds, you'll find that the oxidation numbers don't change. Okay? Therefore, it's an example of a non always going to be the case. And here hopefully you can see the switching of the partners um, Na for H. Right? So Na goes to F, so we get this, and H goes to OH, giving us water. Uh, this is also known as an acid-base reaction. Some of these double replacement reactions or double displacement reactions um, are also known as acid-base reactions. So this top one up here is also an acid-base reaction. We'll talk more about those later. Uh, you can always figure out what if you've got an acid-base reaction because you're always going to get a salt and water at the end. Okay, so what I'd like you to do on your own, and maybe you've already looked at these on your own, um, uh, is to classify each of these as a redox or non-redox and by its reaction type. Of course, um, if you're redox, you can have three different types of reactions. So if you're non-redox, you can have three different types. Um, I've written down what they are and uh, the type of reaction. So I'd like you to go through those on your own, maybe looking at the different oxidation states and trying to figure out that you can get those same um, answers. Okay, and then there's... Uh, variety of these um, that you can do on your own without answers, uh, I would suggest you do them, okay, because I'm sure there'll be test questions on this type of stuff, and um, if you got any questions, you can ask me during office hours. Okay, so let's focus more in on uh, these double replacement reactions or the double displacement non-redox reactions. Okay, so these types of reactions... Um, uh, are really kind of special types of reactions. Uh, like I said, there's the acid-base type of double displacement reaction. There's also this kind of precipitation uh, reaction. And for those of you who were in my lab on Monday, we're going to go over that stuff that I was telling you about um, that we hadn't gone over, that we were going to go over this morning. Okay, essentially, uh, what we were going to go over is a precipitation reaction. So what is a precipitation reaction? It's a reaction in which two soluble compounds, so soluble means able to be fully dissolved into water, okay? So you can see here, lead nitrate is aqueous, right? So that means it's fully dissolved into water. Sodium iodide is also aqueous, okay? It's fully dissolved into water, okay? So when you put these things into water, they break apart into their ions. When you mix these two solutions together, like you see up here, right, this is a clear solution prior to the, the solutions being poured together. And this is a clear solution up here, right? So both of these are clear solutions, but when you mix them together, what happens? We get this yellow stuff forming. That yellow stuff is the lead iodide solid here, okay? And um, you also get uh, the two other ions, the nitrate and the sodium, kind of coming together in a solution. 
But what's really um, interesting and important is the lead iodide. Notice uh, that it's a solid, right? So we see it as a, it kind of doesn't really look like a solid there because it's just cloud of puff right now. But uh, when it settles down, you definitely notice that it's a solid. Okay? So um, whenever you've got two solutions that are fully dissolved, that have fully dissolved ions in them, and you mix them together and they form a solid, this is called a precipitation reaction. Okay? So when two soluble compounds react to form an insoluble compound, that insoluble compound we call a precipitate. So what's happening is the solvated ions are actually being removed from solution. This will always be, or usually, I guess it says, a double displacement reaction. Um, I know them always to be double displacement reactions. So what's happening here is that the tendency of the ions that become the solid uh, have stronger electrostatic interactions for each other than they do for the water actually pulling them apart. Okay, so you know the reason why this thing is fully soluble in water is because water can easily pull it apart. So the attraction for lead to nitrate isn't very strong. But what you find is that the attraction for lead and iodine is much, much stronger, just due to the relative chemical properties of these two ions. They're really attracted to each other. And in fact, they're so attracted to each other that they overcome the um, the ability of the water, the polar water molecules, to rip them apart. Okay, and that's why they're forming this precipitate. Okay, so you'll usually see these double displacement reactions as either acid base reactions or precipitation reactions. Okay. So, unfortunately, <coughs> for those of you who guys don't like to memorize things, um, this is something you're going to have to memorize because you got to know when uh, two ions come together, which ones are going to form a precipitate. Okay, so this um, box of rules are something you're going to have to memorize. And it's really not all that bad. What you find is that uh, most of the group one and group two ions are soluble. Um, all the nitrates, acetates are soluble. Um, a lot of uh, halogens aren't soluble when they interact with lead, uh, silver, copper, and mercury. And I think that's really all of them. So if you figure out which ones are insoluble, uh, you're going to be able to uh, figure out precipitation reactions. Because what I'm going to ask you to do is give me the state of matter. Maybe I'll give you a reaction equation without states of matter, and you'll have to put in the states of matter. Or I could give you just the reaction, and you'd have to give me the product. Okay? So you can, if you know this, you should be able to do that type of stuff. Okay? So let's go over a problem uh, that predicts whether a precipitate will form or not. Uh, let's just go over the problem that's on the slide. So what you'll find 
is that it will always break up into its ion. pertain to this molecule here? Yes, right? Because it's got nitrate in it. So we know that it's soluble. If you guys don't know the charges on your uh, polyatomic ions yet, there's going to be a lot of that stuff on the next test. So you're going to have to go back and memorize your polyatomic ions and charges. So that's how we get the charge on silver, is because we know the charge on nitrate. Okay, so we know when we put these two guys into water, um, they're soluble, okay? So we're going to have a beaker of this stuff, sodium nitrate, I mean silver nitrate, and a beaker of this stuff, potassium bromide. Then what we're going to do is mix these two together and ask ourselves, does a precipitate occur, okay? So what we need to do now, well, should, do we need to come combine potassium and silver together? No, right? Because they don't combine together. They're two cations. So all we really need to worry about is the crossover combination. That and that. Okay? So let's ask ourselves, because when we mix these two, now all those ions are coming into contact with each other, right? So we've got to ask ourselves, potassium nitrate, is this soluble? Or Combustion reactions and rusting reactions, these are both reactions with oxygen. You'll find that they're both redox reactions, okay? I'd like you to go through those on your own, trying redox numbers, okay? And proving to yourself that they're redox reactions. Okay, what I would like to do now um, is go over ionic equations, and we'll... Um, that we've got on the board to talk about the various forms of reaction equations that you can write between um, a mixture of aqueous solutions. Okay, so uh, for right now I'm going to erase most of this stuff. So again, this 
we're going to go over the molecular equation, the uh, total ionic equation, and the net ionic equation. Okay, so those were all things that we wanted to do for the um, lab on Monday. Um, for those of you who are later, you'll, you should be able to do it. Okay, um, so what did we say? We're silver nitrate plus potassium bromide. shows all of the um, formula units, both uh, reactants and products. This equation here is known as the molecular equation. Okay. So let's write the total ion
Everybody understand what we've done here? Hopefully you guys can do it. I'm sure there'll be a test question on this stuff. Okay, so let's talk about this stuff uh, now that we know how to do it. So it says many reactions take place between compounds or elements that are dissolved in water, just like how we have here. We've got two compounds dissolved in water. Ionic compounds, ladies, Ionic compounds and some polar covalent compounds break apart or dissociate into their ions, just like what's happening here, right? Silver nitrate broke apart into its constituent ions or dissociated, the same, same thing, when they dissolve into water. Okay? So the equations for reactions that occur between these dissolved materials can be written in three ways. First, the molecular equation, which is the original equation up there. The total ionic equation, which shows the breakup of the, um, of the original material into its constituent ions. And then the net ionic equation, which cancels out the spectator ions. Okay? So does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Um, and here I'll let you go through it on your own. You can read about it. Um, it just talks about essentially what we just did um, in a kind of a more detailed format. And then there's an example given up here of the molecular total ionic and net ionic. Notice here, in this case, we've got like barium chloride, which of course has, uh, which of course the uh, formula unit is BaCl2, right? So when we break that up into its ions, we're going to have to put two as the coefficient in front of chlorine because there's two of them in the solution. Okay? So make sure you go over this and check that out. Okay. So amounts in chemical equations, the part everybody was waiting for, I'm sure. Um, with chemical equations, the cool thing is, is that because, Sherry, is this good? Because the law of conservation of matter is obeyed, right, because we balance the equation, we uh, show the relative number of each of the particular components of the equation, okay? So, for example, when I write um, H2 gas plus until you put it into terms of moles, and then everybody throws obvious out the window, okay? So moles and particular molecules, you can think of kind of the exact same way. Mole is just a number, just like a dozen is a number, or a pair is a number. So if I have one mole of hydrogen gas, it's going to react with two moles of oxygen gas to produce two moles of water, okay? Just like if I have one hydrogen add or molecule, it'll re react with two oxygen molecules to produce two water molecules. Just like if I have half a mole of hydrogen, it will react with one mole of oxygen to produce one mole of water. Okay? So that's what the chemical equation tells us. Actually, it's a relative number of moles that's going to be reacting with each other and forming the particular product. So if I were to give you the mass of hydrogen, you should be able to give me the number of moles of water that was produced. Okay? So let's figure this out. So if I have 
I don't know. What's somebody's favorite number? Uh, 121.7 grams of hydrogen.
couldn't tell me because you wouldn't know which reactant would run out first. Even though you might say hydrogen must be because it's only got a coefficient of one, whereas oxygen has a coefficient of two. Well, that's not the way you look at this, okay? So limiting reactant is like, okay, let's pretend one of these things was more expensive, okay? So I want to use all of that up. I would want to just use a little bit of that and use it all up. So the other thing is less expensive, so I can um, put a lot of it into my reaction, my reaction flask to make sure all of the expensive stuff reacts, okay? So maybe if I have, let's say, let's pretend, uh, I don't know, hydrogen is more expensive than oxygen, okay? So let's say I had um, one mole of hydrogen. Or instead, let's do a chicken mole, let's just say four moles of hydrogen. How many moles of oxygen would I need to react with that four moles of hydrogen to make all of that work? Eight, Eight moles, okay? But remember, hydrogen's expensive, so I want more than eight moles of oxygen. So <coughs> let's say I put ten moles of oxygen into my thing, okay? Would all ten of those moles react to form water? Not much, right? Because you only need two to one, right? So we would still have how many moles of oxygen left over? Two, two okay? Two moles oxygen left over. Okay? So you do this a lot of times when you're working with two things that one of them's more expensive than the other, okay? So what we say is that this would all react with this amount of oxygen, right? That makes sense, this would all react. But we would still have this left over. So if we got this, we would form eight moles of this, right? But we would still have two moles oxygen left over, right? Does that make sense to everybody? That makes sense, right? That makes sense. Okay, so what we would say is that the thing that's going to run out first, in this case, is what? Which thing is going to run out first, the hydrogen or the oxygen? Yeah, the hydrogen. The hydrogen, clearly, because there's still some left over oxygen over here, right? So we call the thing that's going to run out first the limiting re reactant. I usually call it the reagent, the limiting reagent. Reagent and reactant are almost the same thing. But I will almost invariably call it the reagent. So let's just learn that so I don't have to keep thinking, oh, I mean reactant. Okay. So uh, we'll stop there. Uh, we'll finish up the last few slides of this next time. Uh, I pushed that out back, but that doesn't mean the test is going to be pushed back, OK? So the test is still next Friday. So get, start getting prepared for that, especially with this reaction equation stuff. I'll be a lot of that stuff on it. Okay? Um, so good luck, guys.